Welcome to West Meadows. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us today, whether you are on site or online, because we believe that God wants to do amazing things in your life and in the lives of those all around you. So let's worship him together now. Morning. I invite everyone to stand. Let's begin our service today. Let's begin our I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing, but not. All my failures I tried to hide It was in my turn Till I met you See now you call my name You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Sing his mercy now your mercy has saved my soul And now your freedom is all that I know See ya. The only you, Jesus, when I met you oh, You call my name Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Amen. Today's a glorious day. Amen. Amen. See it out. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now you're To your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Hey Amen. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. It is a glorious day indeed. Amen. Good morning and welcome. We're so glad you can join us. Today is a glorious day that we can gather and praise our God as one body, as a family. And let's just let's enjoy this fellowship. So join us as we continue to sing praises and worship the Lord our God. Yeah. 
to him. So we sing this song, let's put our hands together. There you go. There you go. Sing this new song here. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Let's keep going. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done On earth as in heaven Right here in my heart Give us this day a daily bread Forgive us 
forgive us and we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Come on out. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. All yours. All yours. The kingdom. The power. The glory are yours. It's yours. It's yours. All yours. All yours. Forever and ever. The kingdom is yours. It's yours. It's yours. All yours. All yours. The kingdom. The power. The glory are yours. It's yours. kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Sing it out. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold
Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and He was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now. amazing to know that every step of our way that we live here, God is always with us. You know, this world is always going to keep on testing us. We're going to be struggling. Our faith will always be tested by the people around us, by this world itself. But know that God is with us. And when the race is complete, when everything ends, and when we're all in heaven, we can say that we are here because of Jesus Christ. We are there because God is our Savior and He is the one true God. And if ever you're feeling weak and if you're feeling tired, just know that you can always come to Him to find that strength, that you can pray for all your worries. As it says here in Hebrews 10, verses 22 to 23, it says here, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So we have that assurance that our God is faithful and he will never let go of us. And that is our story, that we have this blessed assurance that God will always be with us. So let's sing that with us. This is my story, 
This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His good. In his love. This is our story. Sing it out. This is my story. And this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. And this is my song. Sing it out, this is my story. This is my story, and this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, and this is my song. Sing my Savior all the day long. Please be seated. Isn't it amazing to be able to say those words and truly mean it, knowing that our God hears them, that we can praise him all day long, that we can approach him now in conversation and prayer, and he's there to listen. Please join me. God, we come before you and we just pause. We sit in the stillness that only you can bring. God, we know that there are things that are clouding our minds that are, that are affecting the world. That there are conflicts that go beyond understanding to our human mind. but we know that you're in control. And it is because of that that we can sit in the stillness of your presence, fully trusting who you are, relinquishing control that we want to hold on to and giving it to you. Because you are big enough, you are great enough, you are good enough to handle all the worries that we have, all the struggles that we face. And we trust you to move in that. For when we are weak, you are strong. And because of our weakness, your strength can be shown to those that we encounter. God, may we recognize our weaknesses so that we can turn to you so that we can throw them at your feet and say, we can't do this, but we know that you can. And so we offer what we have to you. We ask that you multiply it greatly so that those around us can be impacted. Not just immediately, but but far reaching. May we be that heart of new life that we desire to be. May we see that 
come to fruition through your strength so that none of the glory falls on us, but it all goes to you. For God, we yield all we are to you. We trust you wholly in every circumstance. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So we want to continue with our time of worship now. We've sung some songs of praise. We've prayed to a God that we fully trust in. And now we want to continue that worship through giving. And so if you're here on site, feel free to take advantage of the boxes that are at the back. If you're online with us today, just click the button just above me and it'll take you to all the available giving options that are there. All of that giving goes towards the ministry here at West Meadows, whether it's supporting missionaries worldwide or supporting them that are here locally with us. Upcoming in a, in a few, few weeks or so, there's going to be a missionary that will actually come and hang out with us on a Wednesday night. And so we encourage you to look for news of that upcoming and so and take advantage of that and engage with them there because that's where part of your giving goes to support them and all that they do because we are here reaching out and they are out there reaching out. And so if you're new with us here today, again, we want to encourage you to take advantage of the welcome desk that is out in the foyer. We have a gift for you there. And if you are new but, you know, been here for a little while, already done the welcome desk thing, feel free to jump into the next steps area and see me there. I'll be there after service. I'd love to dialogue with you to find out what your next step could be and grab a coffee. It's good, I think. Still should be good. You know, I talk about it every week. We've, we've got some sleeves for the cups today. If you were here with the debacle last week, we fixed it. It's all good today. You should be happy and, and good to go there. And so those are just a few things that you can take advantage of with us here today, but we want to show you a few more that you can take advantage of throughout the week. Welcome to West Meadows. Coming up this week, we'd first like to remind you that we'll have a very short but very important congregational meeting after service today. We'll address the financials from our last fiscal year and affirm new nomination committee members, which you can read more about in the agenda at the welcome desk in the foyer. If you're joining us from home today, make sure to sign up through our website to attend this meeting online. On Wednesday, all seniors are invited to lunch and learn at 1 p.m. here in the church foyer. You'll get to enjoy a wonderful time of fellowship with one another and hear from our guest speaker about managing finances in the later years of life. Make sure to invite a friend to join you. We're excited to invite everyone to attend Pastor Mark's Ordination Council on Saturday at 1 p.m. Here you'll have the privilege of joining your fellow church members and other ABA church delegates from across the city to affirm Pastor Mark's call to ministry. You're welcome to come and listen or ask questions during the council in this milestone occasion for Pastor Mark. That's this coming Saturday at 1 p.m. here at the church. If you'd like to learn more about the Ordination Council, lunch and learn, or our congregational meeting, stop by the Next Steps area in the foyer after service or go to westmeadows.org slash next steps. We're here to help you explore what's next for you. For now, let's hear this week's message. Well, good morning. Welcome to everybody who has joined us on site and those who are joining us online. And yes, thank you, Zach, for that invitation uh, this Saturday. Uh, indeed is the Ordination Council. Uh, just If you're curious what that is, feel, feel free to come chat with me afterwards. Uh, this is sort of the official like three-hour examination where I'll be up on the platform here being peppered with questions, and I will do my best to, to address those and uh, apply things that are found in my ordination paper, which is on the, um, uh, available in the foyer there as well. So uh, it's open to everybody who wants to come and hear kind of that back and forth exchange, uh, and you can even ask questions. If you've got some questions, you're welcome to offer some of your own during that time as well. Um, assuming everything goes well on Saturday without ordination, then there'll be a future Sunday where there'll be sort of a celebration service of that. But this Saturday is the actual uh, kind of back and forth that takes place with different delegates from across the conference. So, so that's what that is. If you're curious, come talk to me afterwards if you have more questions about that. Uh, but we're here today to resume our, our BLESS series we've been going through through the month of September. Uh, so far, we've covered the first four steps of BLESS, these, these simple steps to sharing God's love. And we took a week off last week for Thanksgiving. Uh, but quick recap of what we covered so far. If you've uh, been away for a little bit or if you missed some of these, we, we started with the B, which stands for, B. oh, I was going to, you can just tell me, that. fantastic, yes, begin with prayer, wonderful, we're paying attention. And then, so begin with prayer, and then we get to the L, which is the, listen, the E, which is eat, and then the first S, 
I thought, let me trick some people. Yep, but serve. So begin with prayer. Listen, eat, serve. Uh, and, and some of these are just ways that we can engage with people around us and our neighbors and at work, at school, even, even within the church. We can do these sorts of things. Uh, and, it's, and it's a bit challenging for some people to step out and actively do these. But what I've heard from a lot of people is that it's, it's a bit challenging, but it's accessible. It's something that we feel we can do. It's, it's a very real, practical way to be able to show God's love to people around us. And, and, I, and I love the idea that this is ways that we can show God's love to those around us. Because I think it relates to a quote that I've always really appreciated by St. Francis of Assisi. And he said this. You may have heard this before. He said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Who's heard that before? You heard that quote before? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a great quote. This idea that, yes, we want to show God's love with our lives. We want to live that out. We want to have interactions with other people that reveal Jesus Christ. But there's a question that we have to tag on to the end of this. Is that enough? Is it enough just to show God's love in these ways? Because here's the real question. Can people really come to understand God's love without words? Can they? Really come to understand God's love without words? Now we know in other areas of life that we can show things to people, but that's not often enough, is it? Uh, Consider, for example, uh, this picture. What do you think, who, who knows what this is? Some of us don't know what this is, do we? There's a bit of a generation gap that's going to be established here. This is what's referred to as a card catalog. Who remembers the card catalog? Yeah, I remember in grade three going to the library for a specific lesson on how to use the card catalog. Back in the day for the younger folks, this is how you found a book in the library. You would open the drawer full of cards, rifle through to find the location, and then you would go get the book. Now, here's the question. If we were to show this to high school kids today, if we drop this in the high school library today, even with the sign that said card catalog, how many of them would know how to use it? I'm going to guess zero. I'm, I'm an optimistic guy generally, but I'm going to go with zero. <laughs> would know how to use this card catalog. Uh, here's another example. Without words, people don't know how to use these things. Who knows what this is? Bottle opener. Yes, a few years back, I went on a missions trip to Haiti, and I was there with a group of guys working in an orphanage, and we'd all have lunch together in one of the houses. And we went to gather lunch this one day, and we had our sandwiches, and there in Haiti, they, you don't really drink like water and things like that. It's cheaper, and it's easier just to drink bottled Coke, and it's really good Coke, because it's in the bottle, and it's made with sugar cane, so it's fantastic, right? And so you'd always grab a Coke, and you have to go use the bottle opener. One of the guys was late to lunch about a, like a 23-year-old guy who was an engineering student at the U of A. He walks in, grabs the bottle, and he asks for the bottle opener, and all of us old guys, we point to the wall. And this engineering student walks up, and he starts tapping his bottle against this bottle opener. He had no clue how to use the bottle opener. His engineering brain could not figure it out. We thought it was hilarious that he didn't know how to use his bottle opener until we told him the simple little steps on how To use it. So, the question that we're looking at today is can people really come to understand God's love without words? I want to suggest to you that showing God's love is incredibly important, is incredibly valuable. It it can lead to, to people having an experience that raises their interest in the things of God. It can reveal to people that they can, op- they can be open to a good relationship with us, and it can lead to behavior change. But only telling people of God's love leads them to a good relationship with him and leads to an eternity change. And that's what we're going to talk about today, about sharing God's love with your words, or, or, or more specifically, our stories, not just our words, but our stories of how God has revealed himself to us on how we can love others with our stories. Now, I know this is going to push a few of us outside of our comfort zones, this idea of sharing God's love and sharing our stories with other people. But by the time we're done, I really hope you'll come to see how easy this can actually be. Because just like all the other steps in this blessed model we've been looking at, this one also was modeled by Jesus. And we want to have a look at a quick way that he did this in, in a familiar story to lots of us in John chapter 3. You can turn to John chapter 3 in your Bibles if you want to. The Pew Bibles, it's found on page 862 if you need one of those. Or, of course, the Pew Portal. Scan that code in front of you. It'll take you to the sermon notes every week. 
And this is a story in John chapter 3, where Jesus meets a guy named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and if you're with us a few weeks back, you remember we talked about the Pharisees. These were those pious religious experts, and a few weeks ago we talked about them under the eat category, and they were offended that Jesus would eat, that, that Jesus would associate with tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees really have established themselves as essentially being anti-Jesus in pretty much every way. But there's something about Jesus that just piqued the interest of Nicodemus. And so he goes to him, but he, but he has to go to him at nighttime because he can't risk actually being seen with Jesus because he's a Pharisee. So we pick up the story in John chapter 3, verse 4, where it says, or sorry, verse 2, where it says this. Nicodemus, he, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied to him, verse 3. He said, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus starts by acknowledging that there's something special about Jesus. He has seen enough evidence that there's something special about Jesus. Jesus, we know you must be a messenger from God and that, that you are a teacher and that God is with you. The others may not acknowledge this, Jesus, but we've seen your wisdom. We've, we've seen your miracles. Clearly God is with you. And Jesus' reply is, is blunt. And he makes a statement that overlooks the, the flattery of Nicodemus' comment. And he makes a statement that actually would have shaken the basis of Nicodemus' beliefs. You see, the Pharisees believed that, that everything between them and God was good. They were natural-born Israelites. They obeyed the Ten Commandments. They were part of the religious leaders. They were blessed. Like, they and God were like this. They are tight. And now Jesus comes along and says, if you want to see God's kingdom, you have to be born again. What does that even mean, Nicodemus is, is like? Some of you might be thinking this, but Nicodemus back then in particular is thinking, what does that even mean? You must be born again. But while he's confused, he's still curious. And so verse 4, he says to Jesus, how, how can someone be born again? How can they be born when they are old, Nicodemus asks. Like, surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born. And Jesus said, verse 5, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. In these verses, a little bit cryptic for us a little bit, but Jesus is revealing to Nicodemus something that he has never heard before about what it means to know God. Yes, people experience this natural physical birth, this, this birth of water, when a, when a mother's water breaks at the time of birth. And, and, and yes, we, we understand in a spiritual sense that water symbolizes, and, and water is used to, to cleanse things, to, to make them clean. But Jesus is saying here, therefore, if you want into the kingdom of God, it is not based upon the family you're born into. It's not based upon the religious acts that you do to try to cleanse yourself. Jesus is saying that it requires a spiritual birth, which is only possible through a work of God in a person's life. And so for the next few verses, Jesus and Nicodemus kind of go on to discuss, like, how, how can this be, and, and why have I never heard this before? And then Jesus starts to share his story with Nicodemus. And we have to watch for it. For what he says in his story, beginning in verse 13, as Jesus begins to share his story, he says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Let me stop there for a second. These words do not hit us as hard as they would have hit Nicodemus. For Nicodemus, these were profound words. These were potentially very troubling words. These are the type of words that could get somebody killed, as far as Nicodemus was concerned. Because Jesus was saying, Nicodemus, God is not just with me. I have come down from heaven. I have come down from heaven. I am the son of man. And any good Pharisee would know that phrase, son of man. Because they knew, they knew forwards and backwards Daniel 7. This section of prophecy that spoke about the coming Messiah as the son of man who would rule and reign with sovereignty and power and all nations and all tongues would bow down and worship him. 
In this verse, Jesus is saying, I'm, God is not just with me. I am God in flesh. I am the Son of Man. I am the Messiah you've been waiting for. And then he continues to share more of his story. From verse 14 on, he goes, just as, Moses was lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And in this foreshadowing of his death, Jesus says why he has come, and he reveals the end game of his ministry. Nicodemus comes to him in the middle of the night with a burning spiritual interest. And through a story about himself, Jesus has just revealed who he is. I am the Son of Man come down from heaven. Through this story, Jesus has just declared what he is about. I have come to give my life that all who believe in me will be saved. And Jesus reveals to Nicodemus what he must do if he wants to find God and experience eternal life. Nicodemus, believe in me. Be spiritually reborn and have eternal life. Now, what do you think would have happened if Jesus had just done more miracles? And Nicodemus would still believe, Jesus, you are an amazing teacher. Jesus, you, clearly God is with you. And Nicodemus would have continued in his old beliefs about what it means to be in a relationship with God. But Jesus told Nicodemus a story. He told him a story. He used words to share the good news of God's love for all people. You see how that works? The difference, the power of doing that? Because there are many times where we will need to move from showing to telling. And I know some of us have experienced this. And you'll probably remember times in your life when you have experienced this. These moments when you're talking to a friend or a family member, and there's that voice in your head that goes, this is it. This this is the time. You're like one sentence away. You're like one moment away from, from an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. And what happens? Your stomach starts to flutter a little bit. Palms get a little, a little sweaty. Am I going to say something? It's time to say, I should say something. But then we hesitate. Don't we? Have you experienced that? That hesitate. Sometimes we'll say something. But a lot of times, a lot of people won't. We'll hesitate. And I think there's a few reasons we hesitate. And a few common ones. And the first one I think is this. I think it's because we believe we don't have what it takes to do this. Like so there are some people who believe that sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is something that only pastors do. Pastor Mark will, will do it. I'll bring somebody to church on Sunday, and, and Pastor Mark will just share the gospel, and he'll pray at the end, and they'll, they'll all be fine. Or there's missionaries, people who are called to do this. Go, missionaries, go do it. I'll, just, I'll write a check to support the missionaries to go do it. Or it's just those super religious people who know the Bible forwards and backwards and can handle any question that comes up. Because after all, what if I share something and they ask me a question I haven't got an answer to? Or what if they want to get into a debate with me? You know, maybe, maybe you're out for dinner with somebody. <laughs> you're out for dinner with a non-Christian friend. And, and in, the middle of, in the middle of like the appetizer, they go, so uh, you believe in God, hey? You go to church, hey? Why did God put forbidden fruit in the garden? Your casual dinner just took a turn. <laughs> You're totally caught off guard and you start sweating a bit and you cut a piece of steak to put in your mouth so you have a few extra seconds while you're chewing to think, oh, I'm going to re- respond to this question. And then you, you <coughs> cough, excuse me, excuse me for a minute. You leave the table and go to the washroom like, hey Siri, why did God put forbidden fruit in the garden? <laughs> Do you relate to that? That's sometimes how it feels and how it goes, Right? But I want you to know two things about this. Number one, if you think you don't have what it takes, that's a lie. You do have what it takes. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, even if it is a brand new relationship with Jesus Christ, what do you have? You have a story. You have a story of how you got to where you are right now. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You have a story. And the second thing I want you to know is that you have the Holy Spirit present with you and in you. And Jesus promised, he, he, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would teach us what to say. Luke chapter 12, it says, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves. Don't worry about how you're going to answer 
or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And quite often the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say in two different ways. There'll be moments where, where you'll even surprise yourself a little bit sometimes, where you'll be sharing the good news and a question will come up and, and the Holy Spirit will give you the words in that moment. It may not be a perfectly thought out and formulated, you know, systematic, you know, point by point flip charts, the whole thing. It may not be like that, but he will give you the words to share. And let me tell you this, especially if you are opening the word of God regularly. That time of devotion is not just about you and God growing in relationship. It's about putting raw material into your heart and your mind so that the Holy Spirit can use that to give you the words you need when those questions come up. That's one way that the Holy Spirit will teach us. But the, but the other way is this. Other times, somebody will ask you a question, and, and you won't know what to say. So you know what you say? That's a really good question. Let's look into it together. And then as you and the other person dig into it together, the Holy Spirit teaches both of you while you engage in this authentic process of saying that is a valid, genuine question. Let's dig into it. I bet you there's an answer. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. That's okay to say. If you come on Saturday from my ordination council, I'm probably not going to say that because that look really bad. But there's sometimes I, I got to think really hard. I got to flip through passages. And, but even I find myself at times going, you know what, that's a really good question. I don't have all the answers at all times on everything. Sometimes I need to come alongside somebody and look at it too. So even the pastors do that. Hopefully it gives you a sense of freedom that you can do that then. Even to say, that's a good question. Let's look into it together. Because you do have what it takes. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit within you who will give you the words when you need to respond to these questions. But, but here's, here's another reason I think sometimes people are reluctant. As I say, I, I don't want to impose my beliefs on another person. This is becoming increasingly common. Increasingly common, especially in our young adults and, and generations down. I don't want to impose my beliefs on another person. Please understand this. There is a big difference between you humbly sharing the difference that Jesus has made in your life and you imposing your beliefs on somebody. There's a big difference between you sharing your personal, true, valid story and you imposing your beliefs on somebody else. I, I remember one pastor that I met who, when he was in seminary, they had this assignment to go do door-to-door -door evangelism. And he felt like he was imposing his beliefs upon people by knocking on their door. And this is kind of how it went. They taught them to stand at the end of the driveway, to pray, and then walk up to the door, knock on the door, ring the doorbell, and then when a person opened the door, say, if you died tonight, do you know if you will go to heaven? And they had to do it ten times for the assignment. And so this pastor wanted to pass seminary, so he would go. He would go stand at the end of the driveway, and he would pray that nobody was home. And, then, <laughs> and he would walk up to the door and knock. He would thank God for answers prayers because nobody answered the door. And he would mark it down as one. There are ways that this is done in the past by some people in some ways in some situations where it is imposing their beliefs upon others. And so we don't want to do anything that would be imposing a belief upon somebody else. But here's the thing, folks. This bless model we're talking about, about sharing with people whom you first prayed for and then listened to in conversation and then sat around a table and shared some meals and shared life together, and then served together. By the time opportunities, and it doesn't mean that it has to be like this long, drawn-out process. Sometimes it happens early in the process. Sometimes it goes fast. Sometimes it goes slow. But the point is, by the time the door is open for you to share your story, trust already exists. Curiosity has already been created in the context of a relationship. And so you're not imposing your beliefs on anybody. You're sharing the story of the difference that Jesus made in your life. And here's the kicker. Research has been done into this recently about how people feel, non-church people, how they feel about their religious friends and family members sharing their faith with them. And 79%, four out of five unchurched people agreed with this statement. I don't mind talking to a friend about their faith if they really value it. Four to five people who are not Christ followers in your life don't mind talking to you about these things in the context of relationship and if they know it's important to you. 
because they know you value it. So let me ask you a question. And, 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 and I'm not asking this question to be manipulative or anything like that at all. It's just, just a genuine question considering that statistic. Do you value your faith? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the best thing that could ever happen to somebody? Do you believe that the good news of Jesus Christ is the most life-changing, most eternity-changing news that you could ever share with somebody? Do you believe that? Then Romans 10, 14 says this. How will they call upon the one to save them unless they, unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him unless if they've never heard of him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them about him? Now, some of you may have a third objection to this, and you may say, well, yeah, but, but sharing my faith makes me feel awkward. It's kind of uncomfortable for me. True. Sometimes some people think their story is too basic. I, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, and, and I went to church, and I accepted Jesus as a kid in Sunday school, and I went to youth group, and, well, here, here I am. My story is kind of basic. There's, there's not much there. Sometimes people think, well, my story is too rough. It's, it's too bad. I've, I've done a lot of things, and I've had a hard life, and other people won't be able to relate to it. And sometimes people think, well, it's pretty awkward, and I'm really, really nervous. What if I lose my train of thought? What, what if I stumble on the words, or if I don't say something just, just right? Those are all valid questions. But if we believe that the eternity of our loved ones hangs in the balance, please don't let feelings stop us. If we really believe that eternity for them hangs in the balance, please don't let awkward feelings stop us. Because let's read this verse again. But this time, let's swap the word they with your loved one. And the word someone with you. How can Susan call upon him unless Mark tells her? How can Simon come to believe in him unless Mark tells him? How can your loved one hear about him, believe in him, call upon him unless you tell them? You have what it takes. Your story is not imposing. Your story is compelling. Because the power of the Holy Spirit will take what you offer in your story and he will use it to change your life. Your story is not imposing. It's compelling. And you do have what it takes because you have a story and you have the Holy Spirit with you. And he'll guide you in these things to step out. But before I'm done today, I want to show you how simple this actually can be. To show how simple it can actually be to, to formulate a story and, and to put your story into words. And it comes from, we're not going to read the whole story, but I'm going to quickly summarize for you a story found in John chapter 9. Where Jesus encountered a man who was blind from birth, begging along the road. And Jesus' disciples draw his attention to this man, and so Jesus walks over and he, and he as you read the story, he, he spits on the ground and he makes some mud out of the dirt and the spit, and then, he, and then he, he puts it on the man's eyes. And he tells this man, go, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he does, and he comes up from washing his eyes, he could see. For the first time in his life, he could see. Absolute miracle. And he heads home. Obviously, what would you do? You're going to go home. You're going to celebrate with your parents. You're going to celebrate with your family. You're going to celebrate with your neighbors, your family, your community. And that's what he does. And we pick up the story in verse, uh, in, in verse 8, when it says, His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others were like, No, there's no way that's him. It's, it's just somebody who looks like him that we've never met before. But he insisted, No, I, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, he asked. Verse 11. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, and he put it on my eyes, and he told me to go wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Notice what he didn't do. He, he, he wasn't able to explain how it happened. He, he, probably, he probably hesitated a little bit on the whole spit and dirt thing on the mud in your eyes. Like, you know. But he, he told them what happened. That's it. He simply told them the story. He told him what Jesus did and how his life is now forever changed. And if you keep reading down to verse 25, later on when he's asked again what happened, he simply says this, the one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. 
That would make such a good song, wouldn't it? I was blind, but now I can see. He didn't quote scripture. He didn't go to a deep explanation of how this all worked. He didn't set the mud and the spit out for lab results for it to come back so that he could show the you know, samples and, and all. He, he simply shared his story. I was blind. Jesus put mud on my eyes. And now I can see. You have a story. And you may not have all the words to explain exactly what happened when you chose to accept Jesus' amazing grace in your life. And when you chose to follow him. But I want you to know that that's okay. Because you do have what you need. Because all you need is to follow the same framework that this blind beggar used. And if you're a note taker, this is the time to be taking notes. If you're not, it's time to start. Because part one of your story is this. Your life before Jesus. What was your life like before Jesus? What activities, what passions, what, what did you turn to in times of stress? What, what were you striving towards? What were you struggling with? What was your life like before Jesus? If you, if you grew up in the church and you're like, well, I don't really remember a time before Jesus, think about a time before you got serious about Jesus. I can guarantee you that there's a time in your life before you got serious about Jesus. What was that like? And then you can simply move to part two. Part two story, how did you meet Jesus? How did you become a Christ follower? Was, was there an event that took place? Were there people that God used? Was there an experience that inspired you? Sometimes people will have events where they had hard times in their lives that led them to God, kind of that breaking point in some of their stories. Some people have stories of someone who invited them to come to church or invited them to go to a camp, to a Bible camp, or to a, a vacation Bible school as a child. Maybe it's a friend or a family member who told you about God's love for you. But, but how did you meet Jesus? Who and when and where did that take place? And then number three, how is your life different? How is your life different since you met Jesus? What's different for you? What impact does Jesus have upon you? How, in terms of how you, how you live and, and how you talk and, and how you relate to other people. But also, what do you struggle with now? Because you had struggles before you met Jesus. That doesn't mean you won't have struggles afterwards, but I bet you the struggles are different. Be authentic. Yes, share even the new struggles that you have. Because they're real, and your story is real. It makes it just that much more authentic. See, folks, I want you to know, each of us has a story to tell. And if you can think it through, if you can write it down, and then practice it. I know, it sounds like this, this odd exercise, but think of your story by answering these questions. Write it down. Practice it. Why? Because then it becomes familiar to you. And if it becomes familiar to you and you understand your story and you have the words ready, it becomes less hesitant. You become less reluctant to share when that moment arrives. You won't hesitate as much because you'll know what you're going to say. You're going to share your story and believe that God can and will use you and your story to change someone's eternity. Believe that. Do you believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that your story has power to change a life? Do you? It's not about your story. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit through your story. Do you believe it is possible? I believe it is too. And you know what? That's what happened for Nicodemus. After that nighttime conversation with Jesus, where Jesus shared his story with Nicodemus, we get hints in John chapter 7 that, that, that Nicodemus, that something had changed within him. But then we get to John chapter 19, and it's confirmed that something definitely has changed in Nicodemus. Because when you read the end of John chapter 19, we see that Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, were the two people who took Jesus' body off the cross, prepared it for burial, and laid it in the tomb. Nicodemus comes in John chapter 3 with a spiritual hunger and a question, and Jesus shares a story. In the middle of the gospel, we see that that story is taking root as Jesus is like, I'm not sure if we should be against this guy. And you get to John 19, and Jesus, Nicodemus is one of the two guys who stands up and says, I'll take him from here. Because I believe in him. And tradition holds that Nicodemus lost his life for professing his faith in Jesus Christ after his death. He became born again because he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, come down, to give his life that we may have eternal life. 
And when you take that story and you weave that story into your story, people will encounter Jesus through you. And the story you tell can change the life of the one that you tell. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this story. The story of Jesus Christ, who loved the world, who who loved all of the world, while it was still stuck in sin, while it was still stuck in darkness, while, while it was in need of a light it didn't even know it needed, Jesus Christ came down, lived, taught, showed, revealed God's kingdom, revealed your love. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation made possible as Jesus Christ was lifted up and gave his life that we may have life. Heavenly Father, empower us, strengthen us, clarify our thoughts and impassion our hearts that as we go into this world in a few moments, we may do so with an awareness of the difference that Jesus Christ makes in our lives. Lord, for those in the room who do not have that relationship with I pray right now, Heavenly Father, that, that those who do not have that relationship, who, who are now hungering and yearning and maybe have an open and a new sensitivity to the, to, the, to the voice of the Spirit saying, this, this is what you've been pursuing, what you've been missing. I pray that even right now, right where they sit on, on, online or, or on site here, they even just pray this in their, where they sit in, in, in their hearts that, Thank you, Jesus, for your story. The story of coming down from heaven. To be the perfect sacrifice for my sins. And as you gave your life for me, I give you mine. Lord, help us to weave that story into our stories. That others may see you through us and that lives and eternities may be changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do you stand as we respond? Alone in my sorrow dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my fears he danced. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chain, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend.
A savior displayed on a criminal's cross In darkness rejoices though heaven had lost Sing it out But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began That's when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, so She's over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. This is love. It's so endless love pouring down. Of all the redeemed, oh, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested, my life began. When death was arrested, and my life began. That's when death was arrested, and my life began. Thank you so much. Hey, before we go, i got three really quick things for you. Number one, as always, if there's anything that we can do to come around you, to pray, to encourage you, to, to celebrate with you, please come forward and, and I'll be here and I would love to share in that story with you. Number two, there is a congregation meeting happening about 15 minutes from the end of our service here. Grab a coffee, we'll get set up in here and then make sure you wake, make your way back in. It won't take long, but it's very important to do. And number three, as you go into this world... I want to leave you with these words as a benediction. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and every good word. Amen. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us.